Let's take a look at nuclear power. Pretty much all nuclear power plants use uranium as fuel. And in fact, it's the isotope uranium-235 that's important in the process. What happens is a slow-moving neutron, it's a neutron here, but it has to be moving relatively slow, will strike the uranium-235 nuclei, kind of make it elongated and unstable. And what will happen is you'll get a krypton, a barium, and then three neutrons fired out. And these particles have a lot of kinetic energy. So there's a lot of energy there that's going to be available to be converted into electrical energy at the nuclear power plant. Where's that energy ultimately coming from? It's really coming from mass. The mass of these five products is a little bit less than the mass of these two reactants. And so there's a little bit of missing mass, a little change in mass delta m. And according to the most famous equation in all of physics, mass is worth a whole lot of energy. So you ha if you have a decrease in mass, that delta m, multiply that decrease in mass in kilograms by the speed of light squared, and you'll get a really big number, a large number of joules being released. And that's what's happening inside the nuclear power plant. Now it's very important that these three neutrons are being produced for every fission because if we have we'll say one fission here it's going to release one, two, three neutrons and each one of those neutrons can go along hit another uranium-235 nuclei and cause another fission so one single fission can generate three more fissions now, if we've got a very small sample, well, the neutrons travel kind of an average distance before they'll strike another uranium-235. So it might be the case that you have your neutron come in, and you've got a small sample, and that typical distance is too large, and all three neutrons escape the sample before setting off any other fissions. Or perhaps it'll just set off a couple of fissions and then all the neutrons will be gone from the sample. But there is a critical size called the critical mass. And at the critical mass, it's the smallest mass to produce a sustainable reaction. In other words, some of the neutrons will always be escaping, but you'll always have enough fissions being produced that there's always a supply of neutrons to set off new fissions within the sample. And ultimately, what you want is a controlled reaction. Or at least inside a nuclear power plant, you'd like to have a controlled reaction. If you've got a large sample with a high concentration of uranium-235 in it, then you're going to have an uncontrolled reaction. That's not going to be any good in a nuclear reactor, but it will be great if you're trying to build a bomb. So I know a lot of you would like to build your own nuclear bombs, so I'm going to give you a little bit of instruction on that. First of all, go ahead and get yourself a nice piece of enriched uranium above the critical mass. Of course, be careful handling it because it is above the critical mass, and if any neutron should strike it, you'll get a chain reaction and an explosion at that moment. So be very careful in your handling. Then what you want to do is to bore out a bullet-shaped piece from your sphere, such that both pieces are going to be subcritical. Put a radioactive source inside the center of your sphere, it's going to serve as a source of neutrons. Now, what you do is get some dynamite. What you're going to do is set off the explosion and force this bullet piece back into the sphere. Once it's going to be lodged in there, once again, you're going to be above that critical mass. So you're going to get a violent chain reaction when one of the neutrons sets off the fission. So there you go. A very good take-home project. Build your own nuclear bomb. Now, you might be asking yourselves, I know there's uranium deposits out there. They mine for uranium. There must be some chunks of uranium around that are bigger than the critical mass. Why aren't these exploding? Well, it turns out that that uranium, the naturally occurring uranium, is mostly this uranium-238. And it's only about 0.7% of all that uranium that's going to be the dangerous stuff, the 235. Turns out it's really hard to separate the two. So the hardest step to building your nuclear bomb is going to be getting that sample of enriched uranium-235. J 
Generally what's used to enrich the uranium is one of these. It's called a gas centrifuge. Of course a centrifuge is simply something that rotates around really quickly. So gaseous uranium is going to go in here. And then it's going to rotate around really, really quickly. Uranium-238 is, of course, heavier than 235. So it has more inertia, and that means it's going to go to the outside. The 238 is going to go to the, to the outside. What remains is enriched uranium gas in the center of the chamber. And that's what this red tube is here. It's going to extract some of that enriched uranium from the center and that's going to be your enriched source of uranium. Remember, in a typical nuclear reactor, you're trying to enrich the uranium from about 0.7% uranium-235 all the way to 3 to 5% uranium-235. But it's different for every nuclear reactor. In fact, the can-do nuclear reactor doesn't use enriched uranium at all. It compensates for the low uranium level by using a different moderator. It uses heavy water as a moderator. So now that we've got some enriched uranium, let's see how an overall power plant would work. So that enriched uranium will go in the fuel rods here. And I'll talk more about the fuel rods and the control rods and the moderator a little later. But I'd like to talk about the overall functioning of the power plant first. So all the fissioning is occurring here in this very contained chamber here. And in fact, it, this whole area here is extremely well contained because everything in there is super radioactive. What's going to happen is with the fissions you're going to have all kinds of fast moving particles, all kinds of fast moving neutrons, kryptons, bariums hitting the water molecules. Of course the water molecules are going to get very very hot and they will flow through here. It doesn't boil because the pressure is so high that it just becomes superheated liquid without ever becoming a gas. Anyways, the superheated water goes through the heat exchanger or simply the boiler and that's where all the heat is going to flow from that superheated water into the heat exchanger. So that this water is going to cool down a lot and then it can come back into the fuel chamber where it can be reheated. Now the heat exchanger, of course, we're just boiling water there. We get super high pressure steam coming down here. That's going to turn a turbine right here. Of course, when you turn a turbine, you're turning coils in a magnetic field and that produces what we really want out of this power plant and that is electricity. And it turns out only 30 to 33 percent of your original fuel energy is going to become electricity. The question then becomes, where does this other 67 to 70 percent of the energy go? Well, of course, our reactor gets super, super hot, so it's going to have to radiate some heat to the environment. And in fact, a reactor generally has some sort of exhaust system and blows out exhaust to the environment. Then you've got lots of movement, the movement of water through pipes. You've got a turbine and a generator that are rotating around. You've got water pumps that have to be supplied energy. And so a significant amount of your energy is going to be lost due to friction in the system. And in fact, there's considerable turbulence that creates a lot of friction in the flow of water, both through the condenser and through the heat exchanger. But by far the most significant losses of energy occur right here at the condenser. Now remember, this here is a cyclic process, and no cyclic process can be 100% efficient. And you're seeing that here. We have to have a flow. We have to have lots of pressure pushing that turbine. Now if we've got too much pressure pushing back on this side, then of course we're not going to get a nice flow. How do we get nice low pressure on this side so we get a really good flow? Well, we've got to condense that steam. We've got to turn it into water. And that's what the condenser does. It's really just a cooling system. It could be something as simple as running those pipes through a river. Of course, that's going to raise the temperature of, the, of a river by a few degrees, and that's going to create what we call thermal pollution. It's going to change the ecosystem. Ultimately, what we need is cooled water coming into the heat exchanger, because if we don't have cooled water coming in, we've really got nothing to heat up. We have to heat up something that's been cooled. So this overall no cyclic process can be 100% efficient. The representation below is called a sand key diagram. And this one's for a chemical or a nuclear power plant. And what we represent here, this width on the left-hand side, that would be the input power. That's the energy that's available from our nuclear fuel. 
And if we go straight across here, this width here represents the output power or the electricity that we're producing. That's the good stuff that we want. And then over here, this is all of the thermal energy that gets lost along the way. So we have friction because of the water flowing through the tubes. And we have exhaust coming from the extremely hot fuel chamber. And the big one, though, is this waste heat that's occurring at the condenser. So a power plant is a cyclic process and can never be 100% efficient and is very seldom over 50% efficient. Even the best natural gas plants are only about 50% efficient. So this energy here is quite large. Here's a real life nuclear containment chamber and you can see how thick these walls are right here. And that's made out of steel or lead. It's going to be an airtight chamber and in order to keep that radiation from getting into the atmosphere there's several layers of defense along the way and you might want to read more about that. Now the most important ingredients inside that containment chamber are the fuel rods and the control rods. And I said earlier that I'd talk about the fuel rods and the control rods. The fuel rods are filled with these fuel pellets and that's going to be enriched uranium-235 between 3 and 5 percent generally. Naturally they keep the uranium in small pellets because larger pieces of enriched uranium are dangerous. And then a fuel rod assembly here, it will contain about 25 or 30 of these fuel rods. And the control rods will simply slide in between the fuel rods. And of course the, the control rods are made of a material like cadmium or boron that's really good at absorbing the neutrons. So if we take a lot of the neutrons out of the pitcher, then you're going to get less fissions and you'll get a slower sustained reaction. So if it's daytime and we need some more energy, we're going to raise the fuel rods. If it's nighttime and we don't need so much energy, then we're going to lower the fuel rods and thus control the rate of reaction. So in this diagram here, what you're seeing is this is an incoming neutron, the little blue dots are the neutrons, it's hitting a uranium-235. And of course that produces three neutrons and a krypton and a barium. Now here's the control rods, so in this particular example this, con this neutron is being absorbed by the control rod and so is this one and it's only this neutron here that strikes another uranium-235 and produces another fission. But there's also something else in here and that's called the moderator. The moderator is generally just water and the function of the moderator is to slow neutrons. Because recall it's only slow moving neutrons that produce the fission of uranium-235. Fast moving neutrons are captured or absorbed by uranium-238. And remember, there's a lot more uranium-238 than there is uranium-235. So if your neutrons are moving too fast, they're all going to be absorbed. And the only thing we really want to absorb those neutrons is the control rods, because the control rods, we can put them in and take them out. We can control things with the control rods. So it's essential that you've got an effective moderator in there that's going to slow down the neutrons. Now, water turns out to be quite good because it's got lots of protons in it, right? The, the hydrogens are really protons. And whenever you have a neutron collide with a proton, well, they've both got the same mass. So let's say our neutron has a speed of v. It collides with, say, a proton at rest. Well, what's going to happen if they've got the same mass? Well, the neutron is going to come to a stop, and the proton is going to pick up all that energy. So protons kind of absorb the neutron's energy. That is, they make the neutrons slow down. I very briefly wanted to introduce the idea of a breeder reaction. Now remember, you, uranium-238 is the one that does not fission. So this one does not fission. It is not fuel. However, it will capture a neutron. And when it does so, it'll become uranium-239. And that's a fairly stable nucleus, but not completely stable. And after a few minutes, the uranium-239 will emit a beta particle and one of the neutrons will become a proton. So it basically a neutron 
becomes an electron and a proton. The electron gets fired out. So that, of course, changes our nucleus to Neptunium-239. Well, Neptunium-239, fairly stable, but not completely stable. And after a couple of days, it will undergo beta reaction as well. And it'll fire out an electron, and one of the neutrons will switch into a proton, and we'll get this stuff, Plutonium-239. Well, it turns out Plutonium-239, like Uranium-235, undergoes fission. So it does fission, and it is fuel. Kind of an unusual situation. Stuff that wasn't fuel becomes fuel, and it's going to be a byproduct of your reaction. And in some breeder reactors, that fuel can be extracted and used later on as fuel. So this is a little like putting water into the gasoline tank of your car adding some gas and finding that the water has turned into fuel. Maybe not gasoline, but some other fuel that you can use after just a few days. So there's a reason to celebrate with this. So not only does the breeder reactor produce all kinds of energy, it also breeds twice as much fuel as was originally put into it. There are some important safety issues when it comes to nuclear power. First and foremost, you've got to store all that nuclear waste. And that's generally done in these underground facilities like the one below. Naturally, you're not going to want that in your backyard. It also increases the risk of nuclear weapon proliferation in particular because we can produce so much of this your plutonium-239 in a breeder reactor. And then with cases such as Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima, we have the risk of large-scale radioactive damage, such as with a meltdown. And in the case of Fukushima, we might build a very safe nuclear reactor for normal operation. But what happens if there's a natural disaster, like a tsunami? Moreover, there's always low levels of radiation leaked into the atmosphere and into the groundwater. There's less of this for nuclear power plants than there is for coal plants, though. Mining of uranium, well, that's dangerous because a radioactive radon-222 gas is produced. And then finally, these breeder reactors are dangerous. They're complex. There's no way that it's going to be easy to remove that fuel from a nuclear reactor containment chamber. In fact, the USA gave up on breeder reactors. And now I have a couple of IB questions for you. What I'd like you to do is to pause the video, read the question over, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. Okay, the moderator. That would be the water that surrounds the fuel rod. And it will slow down those neutrons so that it, when the neutrons hit a uranium, they'll be moving slowly enough that the uranium can capture that neutron and undergo fission. So the correct answer has to be A or D. And then look, let's look at the control rods. The control rods, you lower those down to change the rate of reaction. So you're trying to control the rate of reaction. And the best answer there would be to maintain a constant rate of fission. So the correct answer would be A here. Here's a second question. Pause the video, read it over, try it out for yourself, and come back for the answer. Turns out the IB accepted two different answers for this one. They accepted either A or C. So you could either think of this as a system that maintains a constant rate of fission, or the active piece of that is the control rods, which you can slide up and down, and thereby control the rate of fission. Okay, read the question over, try it out for yourself, come back for the answer. So critical mass refers to the amount of fissile material that A will allow the fission to be sustained. OK, one last question. What I'd like you to do is to read over the question, try it out for yourself, and then come back for the answer. OK, so we're being asked about the moderator. Notice that we have a, a graphite block or a carbon moderator in this case. So a moderator doesn't always have to be water. Uh, so why is it necessary to slow down the neutrons? So you've got to remember here that fast-moving neutrons will, will be captured by the more plentiful uranium-238. Slow-moving neutrons cause the fission of uranium-235. 
if the neutrons are moving too quickly, it is likely that a sustainable reaction will not be produced. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.